Hi, I'm Chris Apolito, and welcome to the Get Coached Podcast, where I'm documenting my journey from employee to entrepreneur while featuring the coaches that are helping me along the way. Each episode, these coaches provide actionable advice to help me and you, the audience, find more success as entrepreneurs. I invite you to join the journey so we can go and grow together. Welcome to another episode of the Get Coached Podcast. In this episode, I sat down with Alexis Hasselberger, who is a time management and productivity coach. She helps people use their time intentionally so they can do more of what they want and less of what they don't. Alexis and I talked about how to create a system to outsource your mind so you don't miss out on all those brilliant ideas you have. Please enjoy this conversation with Alexis Hasselberger. Hi, Alexis. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm fantastic. Welcome to the Get Coach podcast. Uh, glad to have you on because we're going to talk about something that I love, productivity. <laughs> Me too. It's my favorite <laughs> subject. <laughs> yeah. So I was hoping before we, well, before we get into really the meat of things, do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself uh, as far as kind of the whole journey as, as, as to how you came to be where you're at right now? Sure. Yeah, I am happy to. Um, I'm, I'm maybe going to go back even farther than, than you're expecting here because it might help people understand sort of why I do what I do. Um, so I have always been a super like organized and structured person, but because I am ultimately a lazy person, like I am a lazy person who likes to be excellent. Like I want to do things to maximum ROI, right? And so like I was a kid in school who was always trying to figure out how can I go to class as little as possible while still getting straight A's, right? Which totally is possible, by the way. Um, and then, you know, into the work world, I spent the first 15 years or so of my career working in startups. I, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I worked in startups where I was handling HR, business operations, finance, basically like all the stuff that isn't engineering and isn't sales, right? And what became really clear over that time was that my superpower was the ability to get stuff done in a short amount of time and have it be done and stay done and be done well, right? So sort of how do I be excellent there, but not work more than 40 hours a week? Because I think that's really important is having that time for yourself, your family, et cetera. So over time, um, it, people, you know, I became the person where people would ask me, oh, can you get this new system set up? Or can you do a productivity workshop for us on X, Y, or Z? And eventually I realized that the thing that was driving me was this time management and productivity piece because it was helping my life be better, but also it was the thing that seemed to be the most um, impactful for the other people that I was working with. So people were really thanking me for helping them get their mindset straight around to-do lists and tasks and things like that. And so eventually I just decided, you know, this is the thing I care about. It's also the thing that's helping people. And so I'm going to go out and create a business around this. And so I decided to, to transition into being a time management and productivity coach, which is what I do now. That's awesome. I knew there was a reason why we got along because I was exactly the same way growing up. <laughs> I always was looking not for, I don't like the term shortcuts, but in a sense, that's kind of what it was. It was like, what can I do to get that desired result that I want, but not have to put in all the amount of effort that it looks like everybody else has to do. So it was like shortcuts or hacks or whatever term you want to use. I, I've, I've always done that to the point where it even caused some friction as I got into my working career because especially uh, my background being in, in corporate in the world of banking, they don't really, they're not open to, uh, to ideas <laughs> like that. Whereas the, the world of startups, obviously, like they're, I, I would assume anyways, they were always like, this is awesome. Like if you're getting the, the same amount of output, but minimizing the amount of energy required to do that, or on uh, even better, getting more output with, with that energy, I'm sure they loved you for that. Yeah. I mean, I used to have a CEO that I worked for who used to brag about the fact he would be like, Alexis can do in 20 hours what anybody else can do in 60. Like that was a point of pride, you know? <laughs> and, and it really should be because that's, that's awesome. Uh, that's one of the books that really kind of sent me down this path of wanting to, to be an entrepreneur, especially like a digital one, was Tim Ferriss's 4-Hour Workweek, mm -hmm. which 
even he admits not the best title, very like misleading as far as what the content is all about, but just maximizing that output with minimal input. Right. Right. So if you could do in 20 hours, what most people are doing in 60, then imagine what you're doing with 40 hours a week. Right. 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 So yeah. Cool. (laughs) So the, the topic we wanted to, to dig into and explore a little bit was, um, the idea of, and I'm very guilty of this, I always have tons and tons of ideas, good or bad, most of them probably bad, but like developing a system to take all those things that are in your head and then putting them somewhere and and having it as like this, in a sense, almost like an outsourced brain or memory system. Um, do you mind sharing a little bit about the, I guess, the concept, the principles behind that, and then we'll start digging into maybe like the tips and tactics around it. Yeah, totally. So I tell all of my clients and it's, you know, definitely something that I do myself because I don't teach anything that, you know, I haven't seen work for myself or for somebody that I've worked with, right. Is never rely on memory, just never. Right. The reason for this is that I bet you can tell memory doesn't actually work that well for the things that we need to get done, right? It's like, if you have ever received a text in the middle of the day from your spouse or significant other that said, hey, just pick, can you pick up some bread on the way home? And you thought, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. This is, you know, of course, right? And then what happens throughout the day, right? You know, two hours later, you're in the middle of writing your big report and you're like, oh, remember, I got to pick up the bread and now you're distracted, right? And then you're in a conversation with your boss an hour later and your brain is just like, oh, I remember the bread and you kind of missed something that they've said. And then on the way home, do you remember to get bread? No. Nope, right? Like, (laughs) I mean, maybe if you pass a store that jogs your memory, right? So like one, we know that memory is just not a good place for actually getting the stuff done. But two, we have too much in our brain right now. So we get, we have about 200 times more data coming at us every day than we did 30 years ago. And actually that's kind of an old stat. So I bet it's even more now. Our brains have not evolved to be able to handle this. And so we need to, in order to reduce stress and actually make sure nothing falls through the cracks, we need to essentially externalize our brain, as you said, and I call it a single trusted system. We want to essentially get everything out of our head so that we can use the brain power that we have to focus on the thing that we're doing instead of this rehashing over and over of, you know, I, I've got to remember this. Like it, it's that same scenario, right, where you think of a good idea and then you're like, either I have to repeat this to myself for the next 20 minutes until I get, you know, somewhere or I'm just going to forget it. That's actually happening all day long to us all the time. It's just most of the things we deem not important enough to repeat to ourselves. Right. Yeah, it's, there's, there's one thing that kind of came to mind was, um, uh, there's so many apps out there that that kind of pitch like, hey, use us and we'll do that for you. Though the thing that I always find that they end up just becoming is a to-do list. And then what ends up happening is is you you're you're I've done this a couple of times. You dump all your ideas into these to-do lists and then you look at your to-do list and you're like, oh man, there are so many things on here. I don't know where, like, maybe I don't know how to prioritize or, Mm -hmm. um, uh, you look at it and you just feel overwhelmed. So you end up not doing any of it. So Mm -hmm. what, how do you help people kind of get around that aspect of it? Or is, is that a, a system thing or is that also a bit of a mindset thing? So I think it's both. So actually, when I coach people, we spend about the first, you know, month or two of coaching really refining what the system looks like for them. And I think you've made a really important distinction, even if you don't know it there. And that is between a list and a system. Like a list is not a system and it is just as overwhelming as you say, right? Like if I think about my um, my business task system right now, I have about 620 items in there. If I were looking at 600 items, every day trying to figure out like, what am I going to do next? One, I would get nothing done, right? Because I would just be sitting there every day thinking, oh my God, what do I do next? What do I do next? Am I prioritizing the right things, et cetera? Um, And so I think that when we get all this stuff out of there, we have to have now a system applied to the to-do app, right? I actually think that it doesn't really matter what app you're using. I mean, I certainly have favorites and I'm happy to you know, tell you which ones I recommend most frequently to my clients. Um, I've reviewed probably 50 different task apps. But what I find is that a lot of people like yourself have 
downloaded a task app, downloaded everything from their brain into it, and then it has become part of the graveyard of abandoned task apps where like you pull it up on your phone and you're like, oh, look, it's a list of things I didn't do from three years ago, right? And so the way that we combat that is actually by having a methodology to attach to the list. So essentially, when I, I use this concept of next action dates. So I never want to look at a list and say like, oh, it's just a bunch of stuff. I always know what the next actual step is for everything in there. And then when is the date that I'm actually going to do that next step so that I can take my list of 600 odd things. And all I have to look at today is, oh, here are the 15 next steps I need to take to move my projects and things forward. And so in this way, you're able to essentially say, okay, here's this massive amount of stuff we have going on, but I'm actually going to be realistic about when I can accomplish the next steps and put dates around those things in a way that actually reflects the time that I have on my calendar. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It, uh, it's, it's not, the tool isn't what ends up helping in this case. It's more the system built around the suite of tools that you ultimately incorporate into your system. So you mentioned you do have some preferred ones. What are, what are some of the ones that you, you I, I guess, recommend more frequently? Yeah, so the app that I recommend most frequent, frequently to my clients is called TickTick. It's T-I-C-K-T-I-C-K, -I -C -K -T -I -C -K. not okay. to be confused with TikTok, <laughs> something very <laughs> different, right? Um, and the reason that I really like this app is because one, the free version is great. So it's like low barrier for entry. Two, it's very easy to use. So it's not, it doesn't need, you don't have to sit there for an hour and take a tutorial or anything. I think a lot of these, you know, task management, project management systems, like they're very robust, but not, a, we don't need robust all the time, right? We don't need a million different tags and like priority flags and things like that when we're using this concept of next action dates. So I really like TickTick. I think if you're in a, on, a, on a team, you know, you need to collaborate with other people. Asana is probably your best bet. Um, I think it's just simple and it has, um, you know, you can set it up in such a way that it is very easy to use and to, to look at things. I think, you know, again, it doesn't really matter though, th so much about the app. It's like almost any app can work. It's the discipline of using it, right? Because I think what often happens to people is they have all the best of ambitions, right? You're going to put everything in there, et cetera. But then the, the one key jump you have to make is that you can't view your task system or your task list as something that you're going to update later. You have to use it as the thing that drives the work that you're doing every moment. So it has to be actually open all the time. You have to be looking at it on a regular basis because if update my task list is an item on your task list, you will never do it, right? You just won't because you'll be like, oh, I can do that tomorrow. And then yeah. you'll say, I can do that tomorrow. And then it's a week out of date and you're like, uh, this is like, this seems like a waste of time. Like this isn't even helping me. Yeah. But if you use it in the moment, if you're updating things in the moment. So for me, I do a task, I update the task. Then I do the next task. And then I update that task. It takes like 10 seconds to keep things updated, but you save so much time in the long run and you don't have to use that brain power to be thinking about what you're going to be doing tomorrow or, you know, at some time in the future. Yeah. I like that. Um, when, when you're, you had said like, put a list on the item of update task list on your task list, it made me think of like, it's like saying, okay, remember to remember the milk. Right. <laughs> you're you're but, not going to do it. No, exactly. And I think that's, that's actually what happens. And another thing I see really frequently is that people will put a system in order, right? They'll get things going and then they'll say, well, I got too busy, so I stopped using the system, right? And for me, it's like the second you feel I'm too busy, that means you have to double down on your system. Because what's happening then if you don't do that is that now you're probably prioritizing the wrong things because you're focusing on kind of the immediate and the seemingly urgent. And let's just be honest here, like what we think is urgent is rarely urgent, right? It's just the fact that it's in front of our face or somebody sent us a Slack message or an email. And so we have to actually like really double down on our system because that's what allows us to say like, is this incoming thing, this new thing, is it more important than anything I'm supposed to be doing today? And if you're using a system that is kind of date-based like this, you can actually easily tell, okay, there, there's 10 items I'm supposed to be doing today. This new one, it's actually, no, it's not as important. So I'm going to have to push the date back. Or you know what? It actually blows everything out of the water for today because it is more important than all of these things. Both of these things are okay. It's just you want to be sure that you're making the right decision. 
Right. It's, it's having almost like, um, uh, a decision making matrix, which hopefully it's not too time consuming, but one, I can't even remember where I heard it is, is factoring in two, two aspects. Is it, there's important and then there's urgent and then, and scaling whatever new piece of information as far as, is it important, but not urgent? Mm -hmm. Then obviously like it gets placed in a certain category, but if it's important and urgent, then it gets placed probably at the top of the list. Whereas if it, is it urgent, but not really important, it's like, okay, I got to get to this, but it, it shouldn't be literally breaking what I'm currently doing. Like I'll, I'll get mm -hmm. to it, but I, so that, that's one that I've tried using and, and not tried. That is a system that I currently use as far as how I prioritize things. Do you have something similar as far as like a decision making almost matrix as far as when, when, whether for yourself personally, as well as when you're coaching your clients, how to decide when something should be done mm -hmm. as far as the timeline? Yeah. So what you're describing is called the Eisenhower box, right? Or sometimes it's called the urgent important matrix. And they call it the Eisenhower box because Eisenhower used it when he was president to oh, be able to figure okay. out what, what he did, was doing during the day. So I actually think, uh, you know, definitely I teach the Eisenhower box. I think it's a really important framework to have in your head because I think, you know, just as you mentioned, right, there are things that are urgent and important. They obviously go first, right? There are things that are urgent and not that important. These are the things that we should be delegating to people, right? If we can can, or then they just come after the urgent things. You've also got things that are like not urgent and not important. And these are actually the things we should just kick off our list entirely. Like we're never, if they're not urgent and not important, the likelihood that they will ever be is very low, right? I mean, I'm thinking about my own personal life. Like I once had something on my to-do list that was like, reorganize all my books by color, right? <laughs> I, this was not urgent and not important. And at a certain point I was like, this is, I'm just taking this off. This is, this is ridiculous, right? And then you've got the things that are not urgent, but important. And I think people really get into trouble there because they don't schedule out the time that they need to get them done, right? So it's like if things are falling into that category of they're not urgent, but they are very important, they have a tendency to, you just have a tendency to procrastinate them. Yeah. And then they pop over into the urgent and important box. And that's when you're pulling an all, unexpected all-nighter on something, right? So I really like the urgent important matrix or the Eisenhower box. I also really like the impact difficulty matrix. And the impact difficulty matrix is, is slightly different. So impact and importance, pretty much the same. But difficulty is very different, right? Difficulty is like, how complex is this? How much effort is it going to take? How much money is it going to take? How resource intensive it is? And so that's another one that I teach with my clients and that, that I use personally, um, which is sort of, you know, if things are both very difficult and very important, well, we're, we're probably going to do them, right? But sometimes not. Sometimes the difficulty is so great, you know, it's going to cost a million dollars or we're going to have to hire 20 more engineers or something that it doesn't outweigh the impact. And then we have things that are um, very impactful, but not very difficult. And these are the things we definitely want to prioritize, right? These are things like creating a template for something or, you know, creating an email, you know, like a, a canned response for emails and things like that. Something you can do once and then it really, um, you just reuse it over and over and over. And you've got things that are like not impactful, but very difficult. We don't want to do these things. Like this doesn't make sense. And then you've got things that are not that impactful, but not that difficult either. And these are your like nice to haves, right? It's like, these are the aspirational items. If I got to them, that would be fantastic. And so I think, you know, when people hear us talking about these things, it might feel like, ah, oh, this is a lot of stuff to be putting around every task. And I think that like, we're not saying, or at least I'm not saying that you would print out these matrices and then apply them like to every task as you're thinking about it. But once you've got them in your brain, it actually becomes a pretty quick heuristic when something's coming in to just be like, ah, how important, urgent, and difficult is this thing? And then you can kind of slot it in where it makes sense. Yeah, it's, it, I feel like I, I would 100% agree. A lot of people would hear this and go like, oh, geez, that sounds like a lot of work, which is going to take a lot of time to simply, you know, figure out what to do. But um like a lot of other things, if you develop the habit around it and, and, and exercise that habit regularly, it, it just becomes, um, a, a, a quick, like you said, okay, I can, I can determine quite easily. Is this important, urgent, the level of impact and the level of difficulty, and then add it to 
again, whichever list is required and scheduling it out as, as part of the, your, as part of the system or a system that you would teach, I've heard this a few times. Do you normally recommend that people, uh, review their, their, we'll call it a task list for better or lack of better terms, <laughs> but do you, do you suggest that they review it from time to time? Kind of like maybe setting 30 minutes to 60 minutes a week we'll say like at the end of the week, okay, like, do I need to reorganize this or reprioritize things? Do you have, do you practice that? Do you teach that? Yeah. So I think planning is incredibly important. I think it's actually really important to separate the planning from the doing. I think this is what allows us to be productive. So I recommend to all my clients and it's a practice I've done myself for years to do end of day planning. And I think end of day planning is actually far more effective than morning planning. And I know that some people would probably disagree with me, but here's why I think so. So one, when you do end of day planning, you are essentially like wrapping your work world up in a bow and you are then reprioritizing any of those dates, things you didn't get to today, et cetera, for some time in the future, because the reality is we can only do things in the future when we leave things overdue, et cetera. It's both anxiety producing and it doesn't help us, right? Because we can't go back in time. So I, and then also what it allows you to do is not only have that disconnect, that mental disconnect, so you can go be present for the other things that you want to do during your life, but also it allows you to just start with execution in the morning. So then you don't have to spend, you know, half an hour with your coffee, looking at your email and thinking, what should I do? You in fact have a pre-organized list that you just act upon, right? And so I recommend doing about 10 minutes of planning at the end of every workday. And in that time, you're going to do like a little bit of a brain dump, sort of get all of the, you know, <laughs> even if we've brain dumped out into our, uh, into our task list, stuff comes up every day, right? And so there's going to be more that's in your head. Get all, all of that out of there look at tomorrow, make sure that your task list and what's on there for tomorrow still makes sense. Reprioritize anything that you didn't get done today. Sometimes those things become our most important things to do tomorrow. Sometimes not though, right? Which is also why I hate the overdue status so much. Like sometimes you have an aspirational item on your list for today and you didn't get to it. And you like, for me, this happened recently. And then I looked at kind of what was on my docket and I was like, you know what? This thing actually, I'm just reprioritizing it out for June because it's actually not more urgent, important, impactful than anything I'm doing before then. And so I'm just going to like relieve that stress for myself and push it along. I also suggest that people do a little bit of longer version of planning at the end of the week. So when at the end of the week, you're kind of doing the same things that you would do in this end of day planning, but you're taking a broader view. So you're looking at your week ahead. Usually by Friday, we have a pretty good idea of what our meeting schedule is going to be like for the next week. I mean, of course, there's always last minute things, but we have it, you know, it's, it's maybe 80% solidified. And so then we can look at our task list and our next action dates around things and reprioritize things to make sure that our plans are realistic. So, you know, for instance, in my world, I have days when I have back-to-back -back client coaching sessions. On those days, I don't assign myself anything to do. <laughs> other than those coaching client calls, because the reality is I'm not going to do anything else. Like at best, I'm going to be able to get through my email. Right. And so if we instead are like, Oh, I just have this list and I got to do this stuff whenever I can. What happens is we feel like bad about ourselves at the end of every day when we don't finish everything that is on the list, but we weren't being realistic with ourselves because we weren't going to get it done anyways. And so you kind of can reprioritize those dates to make sure that your calendar is a realistic you know, visual representation of your task list that you actually have time for the things that you've set yourself up to do. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. And the 10 minutes a day, actually, I, I like that because then rather than somebody going like, okay, well, I, I want to block off an hour or two to kind of structure the whole week. A lot of people look at an hour and they go, geez, like, I don't know if I have an hour to set aside for this, though I would agree there's a lot of importance there but like 10 minutes is, it's hard to argue. Like I don't have 10 minutes. Well, I'm sure you do. Right. Um, I, I wanted to add something to the comment about pro doing it in the evening versus doing it during the day is there's a lot of evidence that most people are a, a lot more productive in the morning as far as, cause you, you just woke up, your, your body is kind of like fully refreshed your mind and energy. And like you're at your peak, basically in the morning, as far as being able to be creative, 
uh, and productive and such that most people anyways, I know there's some that it takes them a little while and, and they kind of ramp up through the day, but that's also part of the reason why um, I would agree that you should not do the planning during the morning because that's kind of like, that's when you are probably going to be the most productive though. I'm sure there's some people that would argue, well, I'm a night owl and I'm more productive in the evenings. Well, okay. Then restructure your system accordingly. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, as an inveterate night person, a person for whom waking up in the morning has been the hardest part of my day since I was five years old, like, I, and I, I think that, like, the world is built for morning people, and it's lucky when people are morning people and can be productive there, but I actually don't necessarily agree that most people are um, most productive in the morning. I do a lot of work with my clients around chronotype and sort of what your energy patterns are, and I found that like there's actually a pretty big um, difference between, you know, it's, it's not everyone, not that everyone's a night owl or a morning lark or whatever we want to call it, not everyone fits into a box like that, but people have definitely different time. like some people might be like, you know what, I'm at my best from 10 to noon. And like other people I work with, they're like, you know what, I am sharpest <laughs> from 2 to 4 p.m. or whatever it is. And so I think that it's more about figuring, like that's kind of more about figuring out when your, um, when your kind of peak productivity or creative time is and then modulating your work around that for sure. But I actually think that like with the planning, do it the, the, like, doing it at the end of the day is important as a separation between home and life because otherwise we end up just having work thoughts, right? Like if you're someone who has trouble falling asleep because you are thinking about all the things that you need to do for work tomorrow, or if you're like on your phone at the dinner table, you know, you're like, oh, I just have this one last email. You can avoid that by doing some end of day planning. I, yeah, that makes sense. I can appreciate that too. Cause uh, after you mentioned the chronotype, I was reminded of, um, uh, of course, I'm not going to remember the the doctor or the scientist who was doing it, but the, the study of the chronotypes, and he used the categories of, what was it, lion, bear, and wolf. So the lion mm -hmm. being like the, the people that just thrive early morning, the bears are kind of the like the midday type people, and then the wolves are the, the, the people that just work a lot better at night. And then there was something about like dolphins and they're just kind of all haywire all over the place um but yeah i think that makes sense and there's actually is there do you know of a way that people can help identify when they are the most productive in the day is there is there um maybe a system or or something that they could try and do to to almost like measure their productivity or is that something that you just in a sense, coach them through, ask them the right questions and, and try and help them identify the best time or the most productive time of the day for them. So I, when I work with my clients, I actually have them take just like a little online quiz. <laughs> and that's like, of course, we take all online quizzes with a grain of salt. But I think it's the one that I have people take is really helpful because it asks just a lot of very specific questions that help people kind of sort this out for themselves. So it's kind of like, it'll be like, okay, if you had to, if you're going to exercise high intensity exercise, would it be better for you to do it between 7 and 9 a.m., between, you know, 9 and noon, whatever? And it just kind of gets people to think, like, I think actually most people can identify this for themselves when asked the right questions, right? And so that helps. And I, and I also, work, when I work with my clients, have everybody do time tracking for a week or so so that we can get our actual data about where our time is going. And sometimes they will track kind of energy levels and productivity during those times as well. And so you can get kind of a, a pattern emerges for yourself. Some people are just so clear. They're like, you know what? I'm dead at 2 p.m. every day. Like that's just like some people are just, they know it, right? Um, and, you know, I think it d depends on how self-aware we've been over our lives. But once you can start asking the right questions to yourself or to someone else, then you start noticing these things, right? And you just kind of take, take notice and then you can work to say, okay, well, here's what's on my list for today. Um, I'm going to do the filing at the time I know I'm going to be brain dead because <laughs> like it has to get done, but I don't want to spend my peak creativity hours like doing my expenses or doing filing. But like I have to write a blog post. Well, I'm going to do that, you know, at 10 a.m. because I know that that's when my brain is like on fire for that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. I like that. The What's the URL or, or the, the online um, uh, 
uh, form that you were talking about? You know, I can send you the link and you can put it in the show notes. Show I notes. actually think like it, I think it's actually a test that was on like in like real simple magazine or something like that. Yeah. I reviewed all of these online ones and I was like, this one actually weirdly is like the most instructive for me. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll just make a note right now because again, okay. I am not using my memory <laughs> to send you this later. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, well, so we'll make sure to include that in the show notes. I agree, though, with the statement of like, obviously, take the the output of it with a grain of salt. It's more to try and help get you thinking, I think, which a lot of those those types of surveys is meant to do is like self reflect, right, and, and start self identifying. So something I want to mention is you are now the third person who I've interviewed who has mentioned about time tracking. So hmm. uh, what is a, do you have a specific kind of system around that? Or is it mainly like have a journal and just kind of sort of try and track things throughout the day? Or are you putting it in your calendar? What's the, what's the methodology behind uh, the time tracking? So there are a lot of different ways. I think there are two primary ways. Like one is you can use a free app like Toggle or something like that. And essentially you set up a set of categories in there and then, you know, you just click a button every time you're switching from one category to the next, and then you can get some aggregate data. I think this always sounds like the easiest method. And then when people try it, they're like, oh, I didn't press the button and now I have to go back and edit all this time and I don't know what's happened. So I think like, this is one of those cases where like maybe technology isn't our best friend here. Uh, what I have most of my clients do if they don't wanna use Toggle and I think most of them don't, or I'm sure there are other time tracking apps there, is I actually just have a spreadsheet <laughs> that I have, you know, it's, it's essentially what time did something start? What time did something end? what was the activity and then the categories. So just like a drop down of categories. And then I have a pivot table that just like wraps everything up and gives us some averages. When people are actually doing this, either they can input directly into the spreadsheet and I suggest people do it as you're changing activity. So like I am doing email, okay, email ended at 8.30. Now I switched in a meeting, right? We're not, we're not talking about the granularity of like, I did this email and then I did another email, right? You're talking about, I switched from cooking dinner to taking care of my kids or whatever it is um, and tracking it in the moment because humans are, it's almost impossible for us to recreate anything that happened more than 24 hours ago. And so if we want accurate data around this, it's just tracking it in the moment. If you can't enter it into the spreadsheet in the moment, then it's like just putting notes on quickly on your phone or on a notepad and then entering it later so that we can get aggregate data because that's what we really want. We want to be able to roll up a week's worth of data and say, okay, on average, over seven days, how much were you sleeping? On average, over seven days, how much were you, you know, screwing around on YouTube and Reddit, right? Um, on average, over seven days. How, how much time did you spend with your kids every day? Or you know, how much time did you spend in meetings that you deemed useless or whatever it is? Because once we have that data, now we can say, okay, what do we wanna do more of? What do we wanna do less of? What can we delegate or outsource? Like, how can we really use that data? What I found is that people think they have a good, they're like, I know where my time is going. Nobody ever has any, it's like, I've never worked with someone who didn't have like a major aha moment around what they were doing with their time in both good and bad ways. So, you know, I had one tech executive I was working with who realized that he was spending four hours a day on Reddit and YouTube. He had no idea. Like he thought it was around 30 minutes, right? Because when we're in that endless scroll and in the infinite scroll, it doesn't feel like that much time, right? And it wasn't all at once. It was throughout the day. I had another guy who was a lawyer and he thought he was spending like no time with his kids. He was just like, I never spend time with them. He was spending like two to three times as much time a day engaged with his kids as he thought, right? So that really helped him kind of reset things. Um, you know, I had someone who realized she was spending three hours a day driving her husband around to different things. And I was like, well, you know what, let's get him a bus pass, right? <laughs> like, there, and so I, I think, I, I kind of expanded onto why we do time tracking instead of just how we do it. But yeah, I think it's a really important thing to do every once in a while. No, I, I like the stories there because I think that's what people are going to resonate with. Uh, I think a lot of people here who hear that are going to go, well, I don't know, maybe I, I don't really need to do that because, and then they insert their reason, but just highlighting examples like that, it goes, oh yeah, like I have felt that way as around maybe like, not spending enough time with their kids. And then that, I like that example a lot because I think a lot of um, uh, 
uh, especially like ambitious entrepreneurs or, or career people, they're, they're putting so much energy and effort and time into developing either the business or their career that they're without really knowing it, they're putting like, there's this level of stress and almost anxiety around like, Oh, maybe I'm not spending enough time with the family, but they don't have the data to back up that, that feeling. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden they measure it and they go, Oh geez, I'm actually like, I'm spending a lot more time than I thought I was. Now all of a sudden it takes that stress and pressure off of them and they're just living a better life because of it. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, I really like that. Um, so I guess one of the things that I, I'm trying to think from the perspective of, of people who are listening to that and, and it's now the third time they've heard it maybe on the podcast and, they, and they're still resistant to it because they feel like it's going to be a lot of work. Um, what would be the message that you would share with them as far as like, why, like just do it for seven days and, and because here's the reason kind of idea. What would, yeah. what would be your response to that? So I think that this, that this is something, you know, I have all my clients do and it's met with resistance a lot right? <laughs> because it sounds hard and it is hard. We have never now remember to do something all the time. Right. I say that, you know, for me, I do it once a year or so. I'll just track for a couple of weeks because it helps me to reset and recalibrate, right? I want to know, am I sleeping too much? Am I working too much? Am I not sleeping enough, et cetera? And so I think the, the message that I'll give to people who are meeting it with resistance, though, is we're not aiming for perfection here. Like, you Yes, we want to track as much of our time as we can. But if you like get carried away with something and you didn't track for a day, like who cares? Just remove that day and you know either do an extra day or divide by six instead of seven, right? Like we don't live in a perfect world. And when we kind of wait and strive for perfection, we end up often just not doing things in the first place, right? And so, you know, if my clients get you know, sometimes like I had a client recently and he was like, you know, I was pretty good at tracking my time when I wasn't at work. But basically, like between 9 a.m. and noon at lunch, <laughs> it was a blur. I don't know what happened. And then between 1 p.m. and 6 p.m., also a blur. Like I was just being pulled in many directions, right? And I'm like, you know what? That's valuable data. Because what that tells us is you are multitasking in a way that doesn't make sense. You're being, you're context switching all the time. And so like, yeah, we don't know what you did exactly during that time, but we know it wasn't as effective as it could be because you were being pulled in so many directions, right? So it's like whatever data you get, it's going to be good. It's going to be good data because it's more data than you had before. Yeah, I like that. That's a, that's a very healthy mindset to have around it and a very good response to people <laughs> who are resistant to it. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I think we've, we've covered a lot. There's been a lot that we've, we've uh, discussed, a lot of different tips, tactics, and obviously some recommendations. Coming out of it, though, what would be that one thing you would suggest people take away from this conversation to help them be, uh, to really help them develop the system that's going to allow them to be more productive, more efficient, and just ex extract more out of their time? Yeah. So I would say, you know, my best next tip for someone is going to be pick a system any system, right? Like pick an app. If you don't know what one is and you don't have a good one, download Tick Tick. I just told you it was great, right? Like it doesn't really matter what it is, just download something. Or if you're a bullet journal person, use a bullet journal. If you're a spreadsheet person, use a spreadsheet. Like the format, the container is not that important. And then sit down for an hour and do a brain dump. Like literally think of every single thing that is in your head that you think that you have to do and just get it out of your head. Because what can happen there, what happens is that like, you'll either have two responses. One will be like, this is so freeing. This is cathartic. I feel so much better. The other response you might have is like, oh my God, this is so overwhelming. I have so much to do. Either response is okay. Because the reality is, if you, it's overwhelming because there's too much to do, it is going to be easier to look at outside of your head than inside of your head. It's the same amount of stuff right? It's the same amount of stuff, no matter where it exists. It's just so much easier to actually make decisions around, to manipulate, to prioritize when it's something that you can actually look at with your own eyes and move around and put decisions around. I think that is a great place to start. Um, myself personally, I like, I, or I've been using Trello uh, as kind of my, my main place 
and uh, just uh, to be honest, once in a while, what I do is I revisit my system to make sure like, does this make sense? Should I be changing it, shifting it? So uh, I agree, just, just pick something, get, get going with it and develop the system as you go along. Cause a comment you made earlier, don't strive for perfection because there's no such thing. Just, just strive to make it better and improve. So yeah, I think that was great advice. Uh, so where can people find you if, if they wanted to learn more, connect with you, what's the, what's the best place to, to connect with you? Yeah, the best place is probably my website. It's alexishasselberger.com. And I am sure you'll put it in the show notes because no one will be able to spell it. <laughs> yep. um, if you are interested in, um, I have a little downloadable freebie that you can get, which is a distraction minimization action plan. Um, a very simple way to spend five minutes of your life to save probably hours a day. Um, if you're familiar with the stats of that, we essentially takes us 23 minutes to refocus after an interruption and we're interrupted or distracted every 11 minutes, <laughs> you'll know why. So you can get that directly at my website um, or at alexishasselberger.com slash subscribe. Awesome. Yeah, I will make sure that's all in the show notes. Uh, thank you very much for the conversation. That, there was a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, and it's, it's really reinforcing that I probably should do another session or a week or two of time tracking because I bet you I am, I'm doing things that I shouldn't be doing. Um, or I'm doing more of, of the stuff that I thought I'm not doing enough. So I really appreciate that. Thanks so much for having me on. It was really fun. You're welcome. Take care. Likewise. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Get Coach Podcast. If you're looking for more information, you can head over to our website, which is getcoachedpodcast.com. You'll find the show notes for this and every other episode there. And if getting actionable advice every week from professional coaches is something you want more of, then make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes.